Welcome to the Lindsay Hadley Podcast Show. I'm coming to you from the North Shore of Oahu, where weekly I interview some of the world's most inspiring people from business, philanthropy, and entertainment. I love collecting humans, and these are some of my favorites I've found along the way. This podcast is brought to us by Capita Financial Network. Do you need help with the next steps of your financial plan? Think Capita. Capita is a financial network built around you. They have a team of financial advisors, CPAs, state attorneys, Medicare providers, and social security experts to help you accomplish your financial goals. Call or schedule a complimentary consultation at 801-566-5058 or visit their website at capitafinancialnetwork.com. You can also check out their financial education podcast, The Financial Call, available on Apple, Google, Spotify, and YouTube. Today, I'm excited to, to introduce to all of you our new guest, Matt Hewlett. Matt has an incredible background in business, one that is kind of, you know, swoon level career outcomes. He's taken um, many, many companies, which I'm excited for him to talk through his journey um, to meteoric success, um, billions of dollars in many instances, the companies, some of them you're familiar with, and he, we're going to talk a little about them today. But to be known as the turnaround guy, Matt, can you share with us a little bit about your journey, how you started in entrepreneurship, in startups? And then taking companies that maybe were looking like they're doing a nose dive and just pulling it out like a miracle. Can you share with us a little bit your story, your background? What what made you you and how did you get to where you are today? Well, no, thanks. And by the way, thanks for having me here today. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I, it's funny. I, I don't call myself an entrepreneur. I call myself entrepreneurial. And when I was um, kind of younger in my career, I start, started out in the software industry back in the heyday of technology about 30 years ago. And back then things were growing so quickly up and to the right was kind of everything until this incident happened in 2001 called the web 1.0 bubble burst which were all these companies that were primarily internet-based companies that really had horrible businesses that were going public without any revenue so you have a 10 million dollar revenue business with a billion dollar market cap it was insane but all these businesses basically blew up um i was uh running a company that combined with uh, what's now Adobe. And I was running a business when one of my venture uh, capital partners that was on the board named Mike Moritz, who's the partner at Sequoia Capital, so probably arguably one of the most successful VCs of all time, leaned over to me and said, I bet you've never run anything when there's hard times. And I said, yeah, I was 25. I was like, yep, never and he published this deck called RIP Good Times that everyone at the time read. And Sequoia has really been on the forefront of really advising uh, entrepreneurs and venture capitalists on what to do in hard times. And that kind of event where I had to lay off people, um, think about restructuring a business, thinking about how to survive and what your true business is, those set of things that I had to learn younger in my career as a younger man really set me off on this um, journey around how to think about businesses um, and how to unlock value. Amazing, Matt. And so you've, how many companies have you worked with in your career so far as a guestman? I mean, you've consulted a lot. You've been an advisor, a board member. You've ran them. But maybe like 10 plus, and, but more that I've advised, but maybe like 30 to 50 companies, you know, that I've advised or invested in. Yeah. Incredible. So a deep, um, wealth of knowledge and different verticals. Can you talk a little bit? I mean, one that I'm really familiar with that I've been a user of is the Rosetta Stone and your story of having just tremendous success with them when it seemed like that was, you know, going a different direction. Can you share a little bit about maybe some of those that maybe the public might know if there's any B2C groups that you've worked with? Yeah. Yeah. I've done lots of different, to your point, lots of different businesses and lots of different business models. I've done gaming, I've done ed tech. I've done advertising technology. Um, now I'm doing pets. Um, before that, I, I, I've done lots of different things. Um, and so the the names that you might have heard of is like Expedia and Rosetta Stone, or a company called Real Networks that really started streaming for the first time on the internet. I think all these companies that I've been associated with, even B2B companies, they all kind of have the same breakdown of what I look at of can it be successful or not. And so... In the case of Rosetta Stone, as an example, what I typically look at is I like businesses with big addressable markets where the timing's are right. You know, great entrepreneurs are typically too early. They spend way too much time or capital too early before 
the thing is the thing. Uh, then I look at the track record of that business, what their current plan looks like. And then the most important is, do they have the right capital and team to really accelerate that business? And so in the case of Rosetta Stone, I think about half of the network, my network, when I asked them about this, they said, um, isn't that company dead? You know, oh, that's oh, wow. my grandfather's language learned. It was, it wasn't, and I kind of view that as fuel. Like most of the time I like these counterintuitive things where half the people think I'm insane. And, but I, what I loved about what still do is, um, you know, it's very hard to have a brand. And one of the things that was was amazing to me about some of these companies that have lost their way is they kind of forget some of these hidden assets, these hidden strengths that they have. And it was when I went to Rosetta Stone, they didn't really have um, a strong conviction around the consumer business. And, and Rosetta Stone had 97% aware, brand awareness in the United States. Ugh. I mean, 97%. That's huge. And so the, it's huge. I mean, like, Hey, Rosetta Stone, I was like, love it. Have you ever used it? Never used it. Or <laughs> I bought the box CDs and it's sitting on a, you know, um, you know, a, a shelf behind. It. So, um, you know, one of the things that it was harder than this, but we really started getting conviction around. And this was a business that was a very small business, had three businesses, was declining, public company, um, was getting conviction around getting good at something, getting good at something where you have some edge with the consumer and a lot of the consumers loved the cd-rom product back in the day or loved the concept of it and so we we actually invested in the consumer business again we had a mobile app there wasn't a mobile app we invested in the brand and then we really started figuring out what type of consumer would like this particular proposition because we had duolingo that was offering a free product Babel out of europe going into in the united states very aggressively what we figured out was there's a about a third of the market that really wanted this high-end language learning solution. And they thought of language learning less about how to actually sound great on a vacation and more around lifelong learning. And so we built you know, a set of product solutions. It was really kind of a premium play. Yeah. You know, we added tutoring. We added all these languages. We added tons of value. And we actually really started growing that business. So we sold Rosetta Stone after about three years when I started. And it was really on the back of getting good at something, taking advantage of what those core strengths are of a business, and then leaning in really heavily on that and deciding to not focus on other things. That's such a clever entry point is you you saw that there was this intrinsic value and you could see where just a pivot would make, you know, all the difference. It's interesting that you felt that you mentioned that you kind of found people's the naysayers as fuel. Is that kind of part of the purview of like why you do what you do? Because of many times you've come into these businesses that are failing. Is it is it the challenge that hey nobody else could do it, and I can come in here like and and make a difference? Is is that part of the ethos, or do you just find that people are missing common sense that isn't common practice? Is a term that I use often that I find is so true because in business it feels like. Empty months. Are people too entrenched in it? They're missing the thing that is the there, there. Do they? They're kind of, you know, they're seeing the forest through the trees, so to speak. It's a really interesting question. You know, two things. One is, you know, there's a Warren Buffett quote about, you know, being um, being greedy when others are fearful, and the inverse is true. Um, you know, so in other words, when the stock market seems to be really frothy. You know, Buffett's basically implying get out. Yeah. And look out. <laughs> it's an counterintuitive thing. And I and it's for me, it's like um I I I wish I was somebody that would stay at a company for twenty years and like, you know, you work a normal, you know, fifty, sixty hours a week and you're you're feeling great. You know, all my neighbors work at Amazon and Microsoft, right? For some reason I just like these puzzles where it's really screwed up. And like I individually and a small group of people need to figure out how to fix this thing because there's existential risk. I have no idea why that is, but I typically like to find like a little puzzle piece that no one's really thought about that's counterintuitive that could potentially drive value. I just like this idea of fixing things and little puzzles. Um, And the counterintuitive piece to it is, is fun because, uh, a lot of things that you see in early stage investing seem crazy. 
And you have to have a lot of conviction and you have to have a lot of grit to get through those those moments where everyone is telling you that you're going to fail and you have to literally just have conviction around not stopping and keep going. So for me, there's an element of puzzle as a dopamine hit and an element of determination that I think is really fun and interesting. That's really profound. The fact that, you know, you, you see this counterintuitive component and then you run at it. Have you ever had that backfire? Like, do you have any stories where you're like, oh, shoot, the thing that I thought was like the, the thing to bet on. And, oh, I just that blew over my face. I should have gone with, you know, I guess what the tide was doing. I mean, can you share any stories that you can think of where you kind of had a false start there? Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm always really um, cautious of declaring victory post facto. Like I talk to entrepreneurs a lot and they're like, oh, I, I'm, I'm, my, I'm killing it in my business. They always say killing it or, I, you know, I had this great successful acquisition. I'm like, I don't know, like, did you return enough capital back to the investor? And so, for instance, I did a turnaround of a company that was an eBay seller tool business. So basically, if you're trying to build a business on eBay, uh, this used to be a, a pretty big deal, eBay, and people had these businesses, it was kind of like um, Shopify for eBay. And you could post products and price them, and it did all this cool stuff. And I was a board member, and the business wasn't doing well. And then I was brought in to kind of figure out what to do with it. And we tr we pivoted this product in this business, like I have to be honest, like at least three times. And I, I first time I did it, I created kind of a Zillow for everything. Like you, you could type a product in, it was a search engine, it would tell you how much it's worth. And because we had this cool engine. And then the second time we did it, we did it something else. And the last time we pivoted, we created basically technology that identified what part of your ad campaign wasn't being utilized. So ads that weren't seen or were below the fold. And that actually got us in a successful acquisition from a company called Comscore that did media ratings. Now, on paper, it looks like a successful acquisition. We pivoted three times. We had a down round with the initial investor. And the investor that brought the newest capital in probably had like an acceptable return, but not acceptable venture return. And that's an example of um, pivoting too quickly and and not necessarily going your way. Would I have done that again? I swear I, I worked harder on that than anything else without as much return as I would like. And so I think you have to be really careful wow. when you're analyzing a business and taking on a business. You know, are you going to commit the time and do you have conviction around the idea? And I think on that one, I was just kind of leaving a bigger company and I thought this sounds like a fun idea. Now be careful what you ask for. So I think a lot of the reason why I become more frameworky as I'm older is understanding those components of value generation are really important because you can't manufacture things like I want to be in a big market or the timing of of the proposition or the or the service. And so I've, I've gotten more thoughtful through some of these experiences that didn't quite go the way I wanted them to go. Fascinating. Matt, did you um, often come in as the CEO, the the president? Where, what was your title when you came in and, and, and participated in these? Was it different every time? It's, it's, I've always been like a CEO or a president, like basically most of the, the jobs that I've had. And yeah, I just... I just like the, I like the CEO role better than the president. The president has to do all the work and gets none of the, uh, uh <laughs> credit. It, you're very, you know, it's just, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, you're kind of like the metaphysical version of a mule, you know, you're just kind of <laughs> doing all the internal work. But yeah, it's either CEO or president primarily. But, okay. And do you have, um, kind of any advice to someone who is either looking, hunting for a good CEO um, maybe to replace them as a founder, or maybe, um, you know, shareholders that are wanting to, you know, make decisions about who to bring in to turn something around. Or even when you're starting, if you're looking at yourself and taking an on honest inventory, do you have any advice about the core qualities or the core aspects that are foundational in the type of person to lead a company? And is it different in different verticals? So those are kind of two questions. Really good question. So I'll take the last one first. So 
I don't think it changes by vertical. It certainly changes by size, the stage of the company. Oh, so that's a startup, great. Mm. small cap, mid cap to large cap. There are different components to that that are very unique. Uh, I find that once you start getting an organization where there's, you know, multiple levels between you and the customer, I don't know, it depends on vertical, but when you start having three hops from the CEO to the customer service rep or whoever is closest to the customer, it starts to become a, a larger company and that that's a difference. And then the second piece to your first question is um, the skill, if you started as a startup founder to, to scale or someone who's good at scaling, um, I think the, the main thing that I've seen that is a determinant of success which is slightly different than determinant of success for a startup is the ability for that leader to scale for people. And so scaling through people is understanding the right person at the right time to offload the things that you're not going to focus on and make sure those outcomes become successful. So lack of mi micro like lack of micromanagement becomes really important as you scale. Um, the ability to communicate clearly the the key KPI called the subway sandwich test. You know, what is that one thing that the organization needs to remember, like $5 foot long? Like if everyone should be able to tell you the most important thing that you need to do, it's usually a number. And for me, I can point to everyone in my companies and they'll go, I can't tell you my current one because I'm a public company, but I point to people and they go, yeah, that's the number. And then also like identifying the right talent at the right time is super hard. And, you know, it's a constant set of coaching and mentorship. And a lot of people view the CEO as like the rainmaker um, or, you know, in the, you know, you think about Steve Jobs as ideal like CEO comes up with all the ideas. Inevitably, that doesn't scale. It's figuring out the right team at the right time and you're setting the vision. And inevitably, the CEO should just be re getting money and not losing money as capital allocation and communication. And the hiring piece and the retention piece is so hard, but scaling through people, uh, that's a long way to answer, is the most important thing that a CEO should be able to do. Wow, those were incredible answers. And actually mirror, I recently had a guest, uh, a guest on my podcast, Jeff Hoffman, who was the founder of, well, he, he invented the self-check-in kiosk at every airport that in the world, you know, he invented that technology and later, yeah. you know, was one of the founding team members for bookings.com and Priceline. And he he said the same thing. He said, I said, you know, because he'd had so much success in so many different verticals as a business professional, as an entrepreneur. And I said, what, I mean, do you just have the Midas touch or like what, how did you accomplish all this? Like, this is almost overwhelming for the average humanoid to listen to you, what you've done. And he said, no, like my main skill is I'm really good at recruiting rock stars. Like I know how to get the right people. I know how to find them, I know how to put them yeah. in, and I know when to put them in. And like, so you're just kind of reiterating what he said, which is really cool. What do you do about the time? Because I'm sitting here thinking, I, I, I'm i sitting here thinking out loud, but I think I have a great eye for talent and I'm, I'm really good at collecting people. Um, and I definitely am like, that person's phenomenal and I've been around long enough to see what are the, what are the you know, little telltales of character and capacity now, you know, I've been around. Yes. But, yeah. but knowing when, yeah. when they come, can you share with like what is the common um, example or or pitfalls to be to get them too early or or maybe too late? Like mm -hmm. any insights you can give us about the timing of the right people? That would be phenomenal to hear. And that's a great question. That is a hard question to answer because I I actually in software I've tried to build literally tried to build and market software that kind of automates middle management, which has been kind of a dream of mine. Wow. Um, but, you know, what are those performance indicators at scale that determine whether someone's going to be successful or not? You know, and the good news is, even with generative AI, we humans like humans. That's the good news. Yeah. Like, inevitably, you know, we all like to be with other humans, I hope. Um, what I, what I, I'll answer kind of in a heart and math way. Mm. The heart way is um, you have cultural Usually you want to have strong cultural values that are codified, communicated, and reinforced in the organization. And that becomes kind of your rule book, playbook on when to hire and fire somebody. Um, that That's one. That's kind of the hard thing. Like you kind of know 
at some level of of scale and aptitude that you know you have to be good at your function you have to, you know so aptitude's good attitude's good but that fit piece usually cultural cultural norms and values kind of answer the heart way of of determining the math way to do it the analytical side is i tend to think one or two years out on people organization. So I think, okay, when I'm successful, two years out, this is what the organization starts to look like at this level of scale. And so generally you have a small business that's growing, you start building capacity. And I start thinking a couple of years out and think, okay, what are the right people that I need to put in these roles? Who is currently in the role and whether they have the ability to hit this next threshold of scale? And if they don't, how do we thoughtfully either coach them up or create positions where they're going to work for somebody else? And I kind of map it. And then I actually spend every Friday for a couple hours, every Friday, starting to interview the people that I'll need a year from now, because most wow. people don't want to interview. Yeah. I mean, most people want to interview somebody that they need the next month and they hire recruiters and stuff. And like, that's crazy. It's like, oh my gosh, when I need somebody, I need them versus I've been working like a lot of people. I just did this recently. Someone who just started working with us who runs our growth initiatives. I've been recruiting for two years. And, you know, consistently. And so is that scalable? No, but I recommend it because the folks that you find over time are both collaborating with you and also you're sharing the values of the company. So when you talk about onboarding, I think of onboarding starting well before that person actually is onboarded. I think about them as like a conversation I've been having in an investment for many, many, many months. Wow. That is tremendous insight and something I would never have thought you would answer. That was really helpful. Thank you, Matt. Like I sit there and think, gosh, to have that kind of foresight, that takes tremendous discipline to be thinking about, you know, what is next in a year from now, two years? Because in, in business, especially startups, oh my goodness, you're just like responding to demand signals every minute. Your hair's on fire. You know what I mean? It's so overwhelming and there's never enough of you and enough time. So do you find and do you carve out rituals or times? I mean, are there little hacks that you do as a leader where you're like, I'm going to sit and think and grow rich Napoleon Hill concepts? You know, do you do, you do those kind of the meditations, the planning, like, is there some kind of a process where you do that that is helpful to you? I'm just curious if there's anything you can give us tips. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm pretty habitual because in general, I'm I'm kind of random. You know, I'm, I'm dyslexic and my kids have claimed that if I were to be taste, tested for ADHD, I'd be the poster child. <laughs> and so because of, because of that, I've had to create a, kind of set, a set of systems for myself and the business. And I try to be very habitual. Like I wake up, do the same things every day. You know, I work out, I read while I'm working out. I eat the same thing every day. I wear generally the same clothes. Like most people, like if I'm traveling for two weeks, a lot of people that I'm traveling with are like, Matt, do you actually wear the same clothes every day? And I'm like, no, no, it's all vineyard vines, wrinkle-free clothing. You know, I just, I try to yeah, remove no all of that out of it. <laughs> I systemize that. And then and then in business, you know, we use a system where we're looking at um, our key measures every week and, and every quarter we're reevaluating those. And it's all based on a three-year plan that we work back from. And so it's a habit while you to keep kind of regimentation in your business and your personal life. And that allows me to carve out extra time to let my mind wander. Oh. So if something's interesting to me, I'll carve out time, like two hours to learn about LLMs. Or, you know, I was just talking to someone who runs the AVMA, the head vet association, and she was going deep on regulatory stuff. And I was like, I'm gonna have to carve out time to think about this one issue that she was talking to me about. So the more habits, habit forming, I, I focus on the things that I know I need to do and that gives me the productivity to allow my mind to wander. And that's where the creativity tends to happen. That's such great advice. I love the idea of carving out time like, oh, that's something I got to stop and think about. Um, do you find, I love that you said that your kids said you had ADHD. I'm 30, I'm, four, I'm 40 this year. And at 39, friends would be like, I'm pretty sure you have ADD. And I was like, no, I know. Because mine is more in my mind. I'm, I'm not somebody that can't sit 
still, I don't fidget. I got good grades in school. I, I've been really high functioning. I'm organized, but, but I, I definitely have a brain that just has, you know, 50 tabs open up at one time going go, 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 go. And so, I mean, I've learned from, I've read a book called ADHD um, 2.0 and there's another book called ADHD <laughs> hero. You'd probably love them, Matt, both books, but I love the 2.0 because it really talks about like most things in life, our shadow side or our weaknesses can also be our strengths and our strengths in turn can be our weaknesses, right? And it really like, That's right. it goes into the research and shows how these neuro, a, you know, a neurotypical brains work. And it's really common that people in entrepreneurship have that wiring, at least on that spectrum, as if there's a spectrum of autism or something, there's a spectrum of being able to hold things in layered thoughts and to think through a lot of yep. connections really quickly. And, um, and so it's interesting and I know it's part of its environmental and it, it actually recommends what you just said, which is to create serious regimen in your environment to remove any additional decision fatigue. So I think that's really, really cool and wise Um, and and hard for somebody who is a little more sporadic and bouncing off the wall, but deeply helpful if you can, if you can create those kinds of systems. So one thought I have for you was um, somebody as talented as you that can come in and is this miracle worker in these companies. I mean, people would probably pay anything to have you come save their business. And there's so much time invested, human capital, reputation capital. You know what I mean? There's how does somebody fruit a Matt Hewlett? Like, how do we get you on our team? If, if we have people listening and they're like, I need someone, if not him, someone like him. What are the things that make you go, hmm, I'm interested and in what intrigues you? And And is it the vertical? Is it the type of leadership is it where it is in its stage or really? yeah i'd love to get any advice about what makes you tick yeah you're throwing me some serious zingers um <laughs> existential questions no i, I would <laughs> they, they are i guess you know and i struggled with this and i don't know if this is oversharing but it, i struggle with what the expectations of my environment, you know, let's say, let's call it society and what I want to do. And so, you know, there's a lot of, I think there's, there's a lot of bad things with social media. I think there's actually a lot of good things around social media where you, you, there's kind of this meme around kind of not worrying so much about what people think about you. And, and so what I've always as, you know, there was, gosh, was a Gladwell book about, you know, there's um, extroverts and mavens and I'm a maven. Like I, I don't like, I mean, I get exhausted networking. Like people are like, Matt, there's a great event with 15, 20 CEOs. Do you want to join? I'm like, uh, you know, my first thought is probably no. And, um, or if I do, I just want to talk to one person there for the entire time. And so a long way way of saying that is I kind of like to work on what I want to work on. And I'm obsessed with it. And I'm not big on like networking or being on lots of different boards. I like to focus. I'm a big focus person. And so to get more of Matt Hewlett is, uh, you know, I don't really seek a lot of, you know, I don't think I'm that great, you know, nor do I think I'm that bad. I just think that I'm, I, I like to do what I like to do. And the, the, oh, <laughs> the secret is finding really good people that offset things that you're not great at and that enhance you can enhance them and hopefully they build great careers and i always tell people that have better careers than mine that like can you just hire me as your intern We're like slow <laughs> hours per week and then i can just kind of ride along on your coattails but like for me it's a long way to saying you know i'm not a big um networker i'm not a big consultant and i think i, I think the people that i respect that are doing foundational work on a business, you find them to be pretty serious people. I mean, like we're not all Elon Musk. I wish I could run three companies or four companies at the same time. It's amazing. Um, but most of the people you talk to that are doing something that's of significance, like something that's going to be maybe generational or something that's important, you know, they're working hard. You know, they're not out networking and going to raves and parties and stuff you, you know for me it's like <laughs> no yeah I, I just i just like to do what i like to do and that's just me you know like people don't even know where i live because i travel all the time like my neighbors never see me i mean i'm never around i like but i'm obsessed like my wife's a ceo of a beverage company and that's all she talks to me about is the beverage company 
And, you know, I've just finished a couple of biographies. He's like, I'm reading the Buffett one, the Lowenstein book. I just read this great book. I forget the title about the guy that started the largest banana company, the turn of the century. I think the people that I tend to, to want to work with are, are equally as obsessed with some problem with space. And they're not so focused on building their brand or building their network or getting their social media likes. They're really focused on the job at hand. And the, those are the types of people I really like to talk to because they're about mastery of something. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's just a little how I think. And and so like people ask me, would you want to be a consultant? I'm like, oh my God, no. Or, or <laughs> join, a, join a board. I'd be like, I'd be the world board member. <laughs> I would. I would be the world. I'm a board member of a public company right now. It, but I happen to be running the company. So so that makes sense. I, I yeah. just like to be obsessed <laughs> on what I work on. It may not be the right career decision, but that's what I like to do. Tell us, a, tell us a little bit about your company right now that you're working on and what you're what you're achieving and how our listeners could potentially, I mean, you've got, you've got stock that people can buy. Tell us a little bit about where you guys are headed, anything you can share. Yeah, it is. Um, it is the coolest small cap company that probably no one's ever heard of. Um, it's been around for 27 years. It's called PetMed, uh, PetMed Express. P-E-T-S is the ticker. Uh, we, we go by the shorthand of pets, uh, PetMed, excuse me. And um, we're basically one of the largest pet pharmacies in the United States. And it's a really fascinating business because we're a pharmacy for pets. And pets is a huge category. It's growing really quickly. Uh, the brand is widely known, at least for a little bit older consumer, and we're kind of revitalizing the company and turning into like a, a pet health expert. So we're adding food, insurance, pet telemedicine, and cool. really on a vertical retailer strategy. Yeah, it's cool. Like every every turnaround I've done, it has three chapters. The four, the kind of the the storming. You walk in, you can do no wrong. New people, new new stuff, forming. That means all the costs are in the business and there's no improvements yet. And that's when you have to have a lot of grit. And the third chapter is always, well, if you're lucky, the J curve, it, it, you're transforming the business at the end. And so I think we're kind of in the middle of that second chapter. It's uh, if any of the folks are watching this want to trust us with their pet care, we care about pets more than, than anybody. And we're smaller and we try harder. So it's kind of like the... Uh, the Avis pitch on uh, there's there is somebody who's never won in the category that I don't t like to talk about, but we're we're smaller and we try harder. That's that's really cool. And you, um, how long have you been there, and how long we, do you intend to be there? And, and, and is that a normal runway when you get involved in companies as the turnaround guy? <laughs> yeah, people always ask me like, how long am I going to stay someplace? I'm like, I stay as long as the universe wants me to stay there. Mm -hmm. Good like, answer. Yeah, because there's these natural cycles. Yeah. I have no predetermined inclination of how long I'm going to stay anywhere other than I have to. The, 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 the only thing to debate on turnarounds is, are you growing at the revenue or unit market share of the market? And if you're gr not growing at revenue or unit market share of the market, then you're losing market share. And so inevitably your goal is to uh, change the trajectory of the business or you sell that business because it could be maybe more meaningful as part of someone else's business. So, um, yeah, I have no predetermined amount of time that I'm in any business. Although if you look at my LinkedIn, it's usually three to four years. And, um, and that's kind of the, the universe working itself out on, on the company. I think pet, pet, pet meds is like a really cool business because, the secret there is the brand is well known, but also we have direct connections to over 70,000 vets in the United States. Wow. And with direct, yeah, it's like, you know, it's harder than selling food. Selling food is you got to get really big and acquire customers. Right. With prescriptions, we pharmacists and the pharmacists interact with the vets and then right. the vets approve the prescription. It's hard. And so I thought it was really, well, I still do a very cool concept and um yeah we're about midway through the the journey here that's amazing so you've been there for how long a year and a half then if you're midway through your dirty two years <laughs> oh no, no, no. it'll be two years august 31st okay cool and and what are the different verticals so you've done um you've done software you you've done retail both for 
people and animals. Tell us some of the different verticals you've worked in. And, and do you have a favorite? You can't say the current one because well, that I like would be e biased. <laughs> well, I like, uh, well, there's kind of like, there's multiple versions of this. There's like marketplaces that are consumer fit, right? There's kind of the demand supply side. There's uh, direct to consumer businesses. There's B2B businesses. There's B2B SaaS businesses. I've done every kind of version of that. I must say that I do like consumer businesses better. Um, I think B2B SaaS, while more reliable, um, reliable from a recurring revenue perspective, and there's kind of well-known playbooks there. I think it's kind of boring. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, and you know, like, what innovation is in B two B SaaS right now? Like, right now, it's like it, I'm not denigrating it. If you're, if anyone's listening, like, hey, I'm in B two B SaaS. That that guy doesn't know how hard it is. I get it. it's a sales team, right? And you're going after a vertical one. You have all these decisions to make. I think e commerce is fun because it's real time. Mm -hmm. You're making decisions and you can see the decisions, changing the website, changing the media spend, changing the copy. And it's super hard to do well. Like those businesses yes. have razor thin margins and b building a brands are, you know, you, you know, it's very, very hard. I just like the, the real time nature of it. I just love that. Yeah, I can see that. That's like that intrinsic feedback loop that you, I could see you because you're so driven by, by outcome and by metric. That makes so much sense. So what are some of the foundational, you mentioned this a little bit, but like you mentioned this, you're starting to get more and more of a playbook. Are there any major principles that you, you know, listening to entrepreneur, any of our entrepreneur friends listening or business or investors so that they can vet if the people operating their businesses they're investing in kind of have these left, right limits of things that are kind of like, Hey, look for these look for these indicators, you know, of, of kind of, they've got their, yeah. their, their foundation set properly. This is the, this is the setup for the plug. I did write a book. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, called Unlock, Five Questions Unleash Your Company's Hidden Power. And, and, and uh, it's a very personal book. I didn't write it to be a New York Times bestseller. I actually got really tired of the marketing afterwards, by the way. I was like, I just wanted to start something. My mentor, one of my mentors, he's like, don't be so wrapped into like success. Like sometimes it's good to just start something that's hard, do a good product and finish it. There's like, he's very Zen about things. And yeah. uh, in the book yeah. though, because I've had such a random set of experiences to answer your question, um, I built this insight score, which is like the FICO score for your business. And it takes the, it, the shorthand is T3PM, so total addressable market, timing, uh, track record, and plan. You add up, um, you rank those, one, two, or three, you add those three variables up. So the max would be 12, and then you multiply momentum, and that's the ability to attract capital and talent. So the max score is 36, and in the book, I basically say anything over 20, and you have a good shot to accelerate your business, whether you're a startup that has... Um, high high growth, but no market share, or you're a cash cow um, that has, uh, you know, a high market share, but no growth or in somewhere in between, you give yourself kind of um, a score on whether you can actually jump and provide value in your business. And I, I share a lot of the anecdotes from my own career, but I talked to some amazing entrepreneurs like the CEO um, who started um, King, known for Candy Crush, the founder of Roby of Angry Birds, the one of the founders of Concur that created the travel and expense software that we all uh, love to hate um, because travel and expense software isn't very fun no. uh, as a user. <laughs> so it, it was kind of my love letter to people because I didn't like the fact that consultants would walk into a business and their first response was, it's time to sell this business or sell it for parts. Um, Sometimes that's the answer, but I have my own perspective, and I think the the FICO score approach yeah. was a way that's very approachable for teams versus consultants talking to teams. So having teams be collaborative with their investors as a team sport was kind of the, the the nexus of this versus you know a bunch of consultants saying here's the two by two matrix that you know we think's going to work and it's all academic. Wow, I love that because. You know, um, consultants often give advice they don't have to live and die by, right? 
And I spent 10 years consulting at a boutique consultancy uh, agency in the philanthropic space and in nonprofit. But we were often the special operators or the special forces. We would come in and be the acting CEO or CDO or whatever. We built stuff. And so I, I never liked the term consultant because it was rare that I came in and just gave advice. Oftentimes I was actually playing like a development director or a, de- a development team member position. We had outcomes and KPIs and if we messed up, everybody was hurt. And, you know, I think what's cool about what you're saying is not only is it a team sport, but you've given them the framework to make it more rational than emotional by just looking at looking at numbers. You know, we can kind of numbers don't lie. The bank account doesn't lie. The market doesn't lie. So it's really profound. I love that. So what stage in a company is too early to to do that score. Can you do that right out the shoots when you're pre, when you're kind of pre-revenue or early revenue or do you want to wait until you've got some great traction so that you can really know if those those numbers have teeth? Yeah, I mean my equation doesn't really work well if you don't have much of a track record, right? And I think the the hardest variable and I'd be lying to say that I have you know um Nostradamus like prof- prophecies on whether you, the timing's right, but timing's so hard. Um, in the book, I talk a lot about um, timing and the people who were very successful in nailing timing will often say that it was serendipity. And um, to answer your question along, uh, hopefully a shorter way than that I was about to is I, you can still use many of those principles, but track record won't be there for the, the small company. I do talk about how you can get early signal to determine if you you do have timing right. And the reason why I pause there is I found that the best entrepreneurs that have the right idea have the patience to see through that idea, but they also have the fortitude to know when their idea is horrible and they need to pivot. Like Slack's a very famous uh, pivot. You know, Slack started out as a, as a games company and Discord did as well. You know, Apple's a very successful later stage pivot to more of a smartphone business. But, you know... I think at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's if you're trying really, really hard and no one wants to buy your product, um, that should be a pretty good signal. If you've been at it for three years, you're not making any money and no one really wants your product, probably is a pretty good signal. In my book, I talk a lot about the science of how to break down whether there's intent around a product and then looking at customer acquisition costs. There's lots of other ways to do it, but I think for startups, their big focus is going to be on product market fit and getting something to work that someone wants to buy and continue to buy. And so not applicable to all businesses, but it, there's, there are elements of it that, that work for small businesses. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense to me. You have to have some traction. And yet, you know, I love how you said that people that are really honest with themselves kind of admit that there's some serendipity in the timing. I think that, you know, that combination of luck, I think Oprah Winfrey, you know, she's the queen. She said something like that ser- that that opportunity and preparedness matching at the right time is what luck is, right? It's it's actually this this um paradoxical dynamic of yeah, like you have to be ready when the opportunity comes or or the luck can't be capitalized in and then it never turns into luck. It was just a missed opportunity, right? Um and so this idea of I think a lot of times entrepreneurs that are out there that have tried and failed, like I've had failures uh, that were dismal, painful, you know, painful, expensive education. Uh, And I've, you know, I I remember thinking, gosh, is it, is it luck? And it's like, no, I think there's, I think there's also tremendous discipline in being aware of the marketplace and knowing timing and seeing something on the horizon as well. Some people are like, I think I, you know, I think there's something here about doing this now and not later or not, we're not going to do that. That's oversaturated, right? Like people can can really, some people have a real sense um, and it's based on a lot of maybe experience or fortitude and being able to be rational Mm -hmm. about things before we do it. Um, What advice do you have for entrepreneurs that are starting something and they think they have something that has real dare there? They're like, I think I've got a tiger by its tail. What are the main things that they should be looking out for, be careful for, what are kind of the pitfalls in business that you've seen where you're like, man, I've seen this story 
play over a hundred times, you know, that you, if you could give someone a roadmap and say, avoid these things, are there, are there certain things? Like, for example, I've heard a lot of people talk about venture capital being a really painful, you know, mistimed um, utility or to, to work with a VC or having investors um, in, you know, kind of tying yourself to somebody where, you know, especially in tech, if there's an API hook into something that you don't own or you're, you're relying on one um, major source for your product line that could, that if they go belly up, you're, you're in trouble. Do you have any advice about that of things to be like, Hey, look out for these things. These are real vulnerabilities for entrepreneurs that are maybe in the early stage of their business. They might be able to fortify against. That's a great question because oftentimes that's asked differently. Like what are the things that, you know, are signal for things that you should be doing and you're asking the inverse, which I think is an interest. That's really interesting. Um, I think too many entrepreneurs are trying to solve a problem for themselves and don't understand the general applicability and interest from a larger customer base. That's one. I think two is, um, Depending on your background, if you're privileged in terms of your background, education, um, uh, color of your skin, wh what have you, you're going to have a bias towards raising a lot of money very quickly. And you're going to overbuild because once you take money, you're required to spend that money because in the game of venture capital, you're required to spend more money to get the next sl slug of capital because the people that you're raising money from are incented in terms of fees to have the amount of capital that they're managing go up because their fees are tied to that. And so once you're on the venture capital train, which I've done my entire career, and I am a big fan of it at the right time, you're on a train that will not stop or it does stop and you're out of money or you have to do something different with the business. And I would say that you know, being really careful when you accept outside investment is really important. Um, and I see a lot of folks raise too much money too quickly on an idea that's half baked. And so those are the two pieces of advice that I would, I, I would give the listeners. That was a great advice. What about those who are afraid to take venture capital or outside investment? They're afraid to partner. They're afraid to give up equity. They want to have control. Do you see that often too? Is that kind of a pain point that that comes across, or is that less less common? And it's more that they're too quick to to cut up the pie. Well, you know, I'm I'm a completely biased with this answer because I'm like all tech all the time, and you know, with with the venture capital route, um, you're looking for. Um, you know, internal rate of return that's pretty transformative uh, versus other um, classes of capital. Um, you know, it's different than private equity where you're taking on a business that uh, is going to have a lot of debt on it. It's usually cash flowing and it has to be reconstituted as a cleaned up company or it's going to go into someone else, other's company and maybe you do an IPO after that um, or self-funded and, and bootstrapped. I think venture capital-based companies, you're looking for kind of these logarithmic returns those typically happen in technology oriented businesses. And so um, that's kind of the explanation of how I think about it. I think the, I think those types of businesses absolutely need venture capital. And it's rare for me to see people not accepting venture capital because it requires a lot of capital and it requires um, really a return that's, that's, that's exponential. And I think the, the non-tech um, folks that take capital, the expectations of those investors are very different. And so, you know, my wife has a, a beverage business. She has no outside capital. She's bootstrapped it. But if she were to do that, she'd probably use a non-traditional VC. She'd probably use, you know, private money, um, you know, with, with wealthy uh, angel investors instead. And so I kind of view that as it's... Whatever game you want to play, make sure you align that game to the capital requirements of that mm, game. That's great. That's great. That's really uh, good. That's a brilliant way yeah. to frame it. I love that. What, what's the name of your wife's beverage company? It's called Rock Grace. It's that's a non-alcoholic cool. wine alternative. Oh, how cool. This is a new thing. Yeah. This is a new thing. I've, I just went to a party the other day and they had beautiful 
non-alcoholic wine, um, white and red options. And I was like, this is amazing. I love this. So it's cool that our culture is starting to shift away. We're realizing, oh, ethanol's legit poison. We should not do a lot of this stuff. <laughs> um, I haven't gotten really the memo cool. on that. <laughs> I haven't gotten the, the yeah, memo sure. on that. But my <laughs> has. Um, no, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's an example of like, you can see you know, with timing, we're going back to one of your questions, maybe five questions ago is timing's really critical. Um, you can see the formation of a lot of these businesses. If you look at Google intent, I mean, people are searching for things like sober, sober curious or non-alcoholic, and you can see the customer acquisition costs like in places like Google being really low. You can kind of see discrepancy. Like a lot of people look at these businesses, like, I don't know, maybe there's $300 million dollars in non-alcoholic beverages against, you know, multi-billion dollar market. Right, right. And people are like, well, that's not market. And I'm like, yeah, but like when these things tend to shift, they shift quickly. Um, yeah. So it's, a, it's you know, I wouldn't, it's not fun running a beverage business. Oh. You know, they're hard business. Bless her. You know, because, you know, yeah but you know the four seasons she's working with the four seasons now. She's that cool. gotten uh, retail distribution. Yeah, so she's, She's doing a, a great job with it. Um, but again, I think the, you know, the brand really does matter. I think about that weird product, Liquid Death, you know, is that water in a can? <laughs> yeah. The marketing, you know, and you're like, kill the this, marketing. <laughs> this marketing's huge, right? So, uh, you know, you try the product, I tried that product, I was like, this is like really kind of weird well water kind of taste, you know, <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> A lot of it is brain and then the perception and my wife's product is she knows exactly who her customer is. She knows exactly how to market to them. You know, I, I call it bougie woo woo is what I call it, but it's <laughs> anyone that really, you know, a, a woman that likes Lululemon and shops at Goop, yes. you know, and Whole Foods, you know. Yeah, that's You me. know, it's, it's very el- <laughs> <laughs> Right. Check, so check, check. Right <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Um, but no, I, I think inevitably it's a product that has helped a lot of people. And um, but when I talk to her about, you know, financing investment, it's it's really like, what do you want out of the business? And so maybe when I advise people, I don't generally like to give my advice. I like to just tell them stories. So when I've done this, how I thought about it, and this is kind of what I wanted out of it. It's, it could be different for that person. I think it's really presumptuous for people to give advice, broad-based business advice. Like you go on LinkedIn, I'm like, I don't know, half of this is, I think, AI, and the other half of this is not worth listening to, including myself. I've done stuff you could say, well, that guy's successful or not. It doesn't matter to me. It won't hurt my feelings, but I'll just tell you a bunch of stories. And maybe like some of those stories trigger something in a playbook of yours. But I think, I think people are too apt to listen to advice and they don't really listen to their own instincts. You got to be very judicious on what advice you listen to. Mm, that's great. I, you know, a friend of mine, Kyle, he's a neuroscientist, and he actually was just over here the other day at my parents' house um, speaking and visiting them today in Idaho Falls. But they, he said, the research has shown definitively that with our brains, that it works this way. If you want get people to, if you want to get people to agree with you, then bullet point information, right? Like if you if you're in a board meeting and you want everyone to know. But if you want to change behavior, you use stories. He said, y- you actually probably will get more resistance from a story. People will, they'll, they'll initially pick it apart and say, oh, that doesn't apply. That's a different application than me. I don't see myself. That doesn't resonate. They actually will have resistance to it. But the research shows that the story is more likely to change behavior. So that's really cool. If you really want to give good advice, I think you're, I think you're on the right track is just tell a story because it, it'll stay they'll retain it better and their likelihood to actually change behaviors increase significantly so okay our last question here matt thank you again for coming on the show you're a, a delight i feel um so honored well, to have met you've you. been, like that's the, your questions are awesome but i'm probably a little bit ver, a little bit more verbose than the average bear but i appreciate your patience oh i love what you're sharing i could listen to you all day um i'm sitting here thinking how do i get you in a year and a half to come work with our company i'm just i'm plotting now on, on starting the interview process a year or two in advance, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, but, for- no, but, no, but seriously. Um, but I was going to say, um, my last question would be, you mentioned you have kids. Um, what would be the thing you want to leave with your kids? Like after, you know, a lifetime of 
helping businesses, being successful, making money, helping people, learning, you know, as you go. I mean, business is really just a beautiful modality for our human experiences. And it is just like something to look- use as a tool to make us become who we're supposed to become. And you mentioned the What's universe's that? involvement in your in your timing and your roles and your transitions. What advice would you want to leave your your kids or anyone younger than you, anyone that you love and care about deeply about what you've learned along the way that maybe, you know, just obviously not encompassing everything here in the last question, but something that are, that are deep, deep values and principles you maybe want to share with our listeners? Well, first thing I would say, you have to be careful with the knee-jerk response is, I have three things. And again, this is your bullets, like your your uh, neuroscience. It's, um, what I would say, you, you know, it's important, I think at some level, let's say stage of life to write down what you think your values are and, and your stories. So um, my kids gave me a book, almost going to get emotional, about, you know, what is about dad. And so it took me like, I don't know, three months, but like every page is like, what was your earliest memory of your mom? And, or what was your first, who was your first girlfriend? You know, it, and it went kind of in places that like, it took me a while to, and I have like, I don't know how many hundreds of pages of this, but I put it in a, a security box in the bank and it's there. So a first advice would be at some level where you've collected some wisdom or perceived wisdom, it's good to write it down and create artifacts. I think the second thing I would say to my kids would be that uh, don't take yourself too seriously because um, you're definitely thinking about yourself more than anyone is. You know, maybe your parents are next and your siblings, but you know, don't take yourself too seriously. Don't worry so much about what people think of you. And the last thing is, um, you know, try to do something meaningful that actually has an impact. Um, because that in turn has meaning in your own life. And, you know, people always will say, well, when do you think you would ever retire? I'm like, why would I ever retire? I love working. I love, you know, that's just me. And so those are the three pieces of advice. Um, But, you know, I think writing it down as an artifact to hand out, like I did an audio book for my book. Like I think no one's really read my book. That's cool. That's totally cool. But the thing I loved about it um, I did an audio book and I was at, and I, when I finished, I was like, I bet as long as this digital, I don't know, hopefully somebody stores in the cloud is like, it, it'd be cool if like one of my great grandkids could actually hear me talking out this book. They guy was kind of interesting. Like I would love to have that kind of artifact. So just write it down. Um, even if, even if you're not all aligned with values or maybe there's different decisions genetically your legacy makes i think it's important to write it down because inevitably um you know you want to live a good life hopefully a high integrity life and give back but also hopefully you're giving back a a line of people and make the world a better place so that that's my advice oh that was stunning answer you're amazing matt thank you so much for coming on my show and for all you've done to help so many businesses and people and uh and the impact you've had is obviously indelible. So thank you again. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. you. Do you need help with the next steps for your financial plan? Think Capita. Capita is a financial network built around you. They have a team of financial advisors, CPAs, estate attorneys, Medicare providers, and social security experts to help you accomplish your financial goals. Call to schedule a complimentary consultation at 801-566-5058. Or visit their website at www.capitafinancialnetwork.com. You can also check out their financial education podcast, The Financial Call, available on Apple, Google, Spotify, and YouTube.